Just leave it messy, son. <laughs> Just a wee bit off the top, eh? Just a wee bit off the top, eh? <laughs> there's fuck all on the top to leave there, so, so you leave. Well, this is going to be episode two of the Barber Chair Confessions, and this is the one that we're going to try and do for the bus. The first one I did was a tester for um, whether it would work or not, whether it was too horrendous to listen to with, with the buzzes and the, all the noises that come out of the barber shop, but it turned out it was quite almost therapeutic with some people, I guess, because it's people are kind of into that. We, the way the noise is uh, when, they, when they put the microphones up to the, the tools and stuff but luckily what we're doing today is just a hot towel shave so it's not going to have too much too much buzzing going on uh, so I've got you'll recognise if you've watched the bus long enough now I've got my dad in the chair uh, Johnny who is the culprit some people might say of um, Putting Celtic above <laughs> other things, <laughs> whether it's uh, watching Celtic on a Sunday when I should be out walking the dog with my wife, or on a podcast with a bunch of random guys I've never met before, till God knows what time in the morning talking about Celtic. <sighs> but, uh, Dad, if people watch the bus long enough, they'll know that you now stay you stay in Lincoln, so you've actually taken a fairly big trip up to visit this weekend, so this is the best opportunity we've got to do this for you. Well, um, let's, let's talk a wee bit about you, because I think the idea that we've got is to allow the, the passengers on the bus to start learning more about the guys that they watch every week. And I'm hoping, I know that the guys stay like in Glasgow and Canada, <laughs> but it would be good to get them in, in the chair as well so we can start to learn a wee bit more about the guys, so tell us, how did your Celtic, you know, your love of Celtic begin? Uh, my love of Celtic began the same way as I would imagine a lot of us did, um, passed down here from my, from my dad, um, there was no real choice in the matter, the, the story actually goes that on the day I was born my dad turned up at the the maternity ward at Bangor Hospital in Broxburn, I believe it is, and uh, with a, this lovely Celtic scarf, it was a silk one. I've no idea what happened to it. The last time I've seen it must have been about 30 years ago, but it was a, a lovely green silk with shamrocks printed on it and white fringes. It looked lovely. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't have kept you warm in the Sahara, but... Uh, it was a lovely looking scarf, and I always remember it, I always kept it. But unfortunately I went missing about, well, like I said, the last time I seen it was 30 years ago, and I would, I would love, I was hoping that when my mum had died and I, and I was clearing the house out, I was hoping I'd find it hidden in a, in a cupboard somewhere, or the back of a drawer somewhere, but unfortunately it didn't show up. Lots of other crap did, like, but that, that didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it was my dad, he was the... He was a Celtic supporter, uh, and he made sure I was. Um, like I you didn't, did with me. Like I did with you, yeah. I mean, like, say, I get people telling me that I brainwashed you, but I prefer to think of it as I just gave you a proper education. Um, and it was a tough time to give you that education, because it was uh, in the early to mid-90s, which was obviously our uh, one of the grim periods of our uh, Celtic supporting lifetime. But uh, we got through it, <laughs> and I uh, don't feel any guilt at making you be a Celtic man. Bringing you up properly is how I keep putting it to people. If I'm right in remembering, you told me that my auntie Diane, who used to be employed by a certain Rangers owner, yep. 
try to uh, get me a couple of Rangers tops for Christmas, is that not right? So I don't think she went as far as getting them, but she did ask me what I would do if uh, the uh, if she was to get you and Matthew Rangers tops for your Christmas, and I says, well, I wouldn't. You'd be completely wasting your time because they wouldn't even get in the house and just go straight to the bin at the side of the front door. Um, but there was another time she actually phoned me up. I was actually working in the back garden, tidying up the garden. She asked me what I was doing. I said, oh, I'm doing the garden. I said, why? She says, oh, well, what I should have said is your auntie Diane used to also work at Mur uh, Ibrox, um, doing some of the catering stuff, you know, in the in the luxury boxes, in the uh, boxes she offered me to bring you and Matthew through. So would you like to bring them through to the game? My exact words to United Diane was, why the fuck would I want to do that? Uh, she says, well, it's free. I says, you could pay me and I still wouldn't be coming through, Diane. <laughs> you know, why would I bring my boys and waste my Saturday afternoon to watch Rangers against Motherwell? I said, I'll tell you what, Diane, I said, this is how bad it is. I'm actually in the garden and I would rather stay here. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So you know, Diane used to work for David Murray, and well, you know, she actually worked for David Murray's sister, Katie, but she did do some work for David Murray at Ibrox on the Saturdays. But well, yeah, for, sins. <laughs> for her sins, yeah. But, no, um, I remember you told me that, yeah. and uh, I think she still she still tries to. Yeah, well, she'll never learn, will she? No. Nah. Well, that's fine. They never do. <laughs> So, I want to move on to talking about the bus because, as wanky as it sounds, the bus has kind of brought a lot of guys that I've never, either, I've only met in public once. Apparently it was an absolute riot. <laughs> but uh, I'd only met them for three hours, an actual person, and I would never have got to know a Mark Kearney or a or a Conor Carr, or a Phil McGinley, or a Russell Boyce if it wasn't for the bus. And obviously you weren't able to, because obviously where you, where you stay, you weren't obviously able to come up at that time. But I remember you saying that you really just enjoyed being like just a viewer of the bus at the time because it reminded you of when you couldn't, when you used to be obviously on the, the supporters buses. And I think that's, Obviously, I've never really done the supporters bus. I've only done it once. I usually, if I ever go to Celtic Park, it's usually just in the car. Um, and to be honest, it's rarely that I'd get to Celtic Park due to the nature of my job, but I would always make sure I try and get to at least a qualifier. Didn't get to qualify this year. Uh, obviously, for obvious reasons, uh, which was a price I was willing to, <laughs> to pay not getting to a European game this season, but that's fine. So you, you said to me that it reminded you of being on the on the supporters bus, and is that is that what attracted you to just watching the bus when you were when you were mainly just you know a passenger before you kind of jumped on to contribute? Yeah, I mean it, it did. I mean, like my my first experience with supporters buses was when I was really too young to appreciate them. When we first moved to Glen Rothes in 1973, 74, um, my dad used to take us occasionally on the supporters bus with, with my uncle David. Um, we used to get on the the Lagelli supporters bus, although we used to pick us up in Glenrothes, and this was back in the days when, although we got picked up in Glenrothes, they'd stop at Cowden Beath for a few beers, and we'd be left sitting on the bus, because I was that time I was only about 12, 11 or 12, and my dad and my uncle and the rest of the lads used to go into the pub and have a few beers and then go just through to the game. We didn't go on a regular, regular basis, but we went three or four times a year maybe um, that, we would, that we'd go to the football. Fun money was a bit tight for my dad at that time, he just come at the RAF, but I think one of the first game, the first game I actually seen Celtic live um, was at Dunfermline, against Dunfermline obviously. I think Celtic won 3-2 and I'm sure Harry Hood scored a, scored a hat-trick that day. Um, Harry Hood probably one of the more understated and possibly undervalued members of the Celtic heroes, if you like, back then. But yeah, I remember that. Um, and then I remember going to Celtic Park with my dad again on the bus. Um, I think one of the first games I've seen there was uh, Celtic against Clyde. That was back in the days when Clyde were in the, what was the first division back in them days. 
I remember Celtic when that came in, it was 6 or 7-1. And there was, there was a an up-and-coming player, I mean, it might have been a bit more of an up-and-coming player, but a guy called Brian McLaughlin, I'm sure it was Brian McLaughlin, um, and he received a serious injury that day, uh, which turned out to be a career-ending um, injury for them. But uh, yeah, they were my sort of early games that I remember going to. Although I do always remember, I've got it convinced, because when the, my f we lived in, when your granddad or my dad was in the RAF and his last posting was at RAF Kinloss, right up north of Scotland near Forest. And I've got it in my head and I've got this memory of a Celtic Elgin game. It just must have been about 1972 because it was just after Ali Hunter had signed as goalkeeper from Kilmarnock. Uh, but I can't find any record of that game at all. I had in my head it was a cup game, but I just cannot find any record for it. So I'm sure I didn't make it up. Maybe it was just a friendly that I can't find any record for it. But but yeah, so they were my sort of earlier supporting days. Although one of my most vivid memories as a Celtic supporter back then was the game that we watched on the telly. I was seeing the telly. It was uh, 1972 against the uh, East... Sorry, Inter Milan. And Dixie Dean's missed a penalty kick that put us out of the European Cup. I remember going to bed in tears that night. And it wasn't wasn't best chuffed, but uh, but yeah. So that was uh, my earlier memories of supporting the famous green and white hoops. What was your um, first experience at Celtic Park? Like, so I remember mine, and it was it wasn't it, it wasn't a <laughs> yeah. I remember yours. I, I'm right. Was it not the Hearts game away where we watched it on the screen in the stadium? I remember that briefly. Do you remember that? No, I don't they, they showed an away game at the actual stadium and we sat on the ground and watched it on the screen. I, I don't know why I remember that, but oh god, I don't remember that. No, that's I. No, I, I really don't. I remember. Maybe that, was my, maybe that wasn't my first experience, but I, that sticks in my head because I did think it was bizarre that we were watching Celtic Hearts on the on the uh, the main stand. God, I've got uh, honestly, you've completely thrown me on that one. I've got no yeah. memory of that at all. Was it your other dad that took you? Might have been. Yeah. <laughs> your real dad. <laughs> but uh, no, my memory, first memory of taking you to a Celtic game was uh, the ill fated uh, Inverness Cali. Oh, yeah, well, right enough. Game, yeah. Well, yeah, when you originally meant to take us there, the, the game got cancelled. That's it? right, yeah. Did I take you to the rearranged game? Um, on the Wednesday, it was on the Wednesday night. I hope not. <laughs> I, think I, I hope you didn't take me there. I'll, your mum might not let me take you because knew we wouldn't get back to whatever time, like yeah. But the uh, the memory of the first game was we were never. Well, we actually got to see Celtic that day, but we didn't see them playing, did we? Because we ended up in the uh, at the training ground, the, the training the Battlefield training ground, and we got to watch them having a bounce game and. You managed to get some of the autographs, didn't you? Yeah, I remember Martin Duca being a dick. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like he was... Yeah. Don't meet your heroes, folks. <laughs> <laughs> he, wouldn't, he wouldn't hang around long enough to take the vote, because... That's right. I was too busy. I remember I just told every Celtic player I went up to, including Reggie Blinker, <laughs> that he was my favourite Celtic player. Yeah. <laughs> You're my favourite Celtic player, yeah. Reggie. You're my favourite Celtic player. <laughs> Where am I? Where's Larson? <laughs> oh yeah, he broke his leg. So he was there. Um, but then you were shouting on my cousin Mark to yeah. hurry up because you could tell Baduka was, was getting a bit um, fed up to the point where he ended up just not taking it. Saying, say now, fuck it, I'm off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, fuck that guy. But that's fine. Um, I want to just quickly <laughs> talk about not Celtic, but you and I remember pitching a Russell about getting you on uh, because it was just I just thought it'd be funny that your your actual uh, job is a bus driver. So I thought, well, why don't you just get a real bus driver on the bus? Because <laughs> I for months thought that Russell was in fact a bus driver. Uh, so I was quite um, disappointed to find that he wasn't. Uh, but then he, you know, <laughs> there was no real reason to actually think, well, he is a bus driver. It was just a. I need a name for the podcast, and he used to use the, the, the term, I'm on the bus a lot, so. I said, well, let's get a real bus driver on the bus for uh, one of the Double Down shows. Uh, yeah, that's when you decided to throw me under it, wasn't it? That's right, I made sure that you weren't going to be a shite bag, and you came on, because shite bag if you didn't, eh? And luckily you did come on. So, you said 
to me off camera that you had a funny training story and I'm quite intrigued to hear. Oh, this is a... For those that don't know, I, I used to work for Stagecoach, I used to be an, an, an instructor. Uh, I'd done the instructing for about 10 years and I was training this guy about, must be about seven or eight years ago now. And we'd be going down this street in, in Lincoln in the training vehicle. And I remember saying to the guy, take the next road on the left. And he just fucking breezed right past it. And I was like, all right, okay, fair enough. So then I turned him around a bit and we come around and I says, right, take the next road on the left. And again, he just blanked it. He just drove right past it. And I thought, I said to him, I said, what the fuck? So anyway, we came back round again to the same road and I said, right, I said, take the next road on the left. And again, he blanked it and I pulled him up. I said, what are you doing? That's three times I've asked you to turn left into that road and three times you've blanked it. You've just sealed right past. What the fuck are you doing? Because that's how I used to talk to my trainees. And uh, he says, I can't go down there. I says, what do you mean you can't go down there? It's dead simple. It's just the same as any other left turn junction. He says, he says no, my... My, my wife lives down there and I've got a court injunction. I'm not allowed to go down that street by law. <laughs> and I thought, well, why didn't you just fucking tell me that? Anyway, about a week later, he obviously broke that injunction because he didn't turn up for work one morning. So I phoned up my gaffer and I said, I can't even remember what the guy's name was. I said, anyway, such and such is not coming in today. Uh, he's not turned up. He says, yeah, I know he's, uh, he's otherwise... Um, withheld, uh, detained. I went, what do you mean? He said, well, he's in the cop shop at the minute. So I think he'd actually decided to breach this uh, this instruction and he, he went down that road <laughs> and got lifted. And we never have seen him again, so I don't know whatever happened in the end, but I just thought it was quite amusing that he uh, refused to turn into that junction because he had a court in injunction against him going down to Wint Avenue. That's the beauty of, the, of being on public transport such as the bus. You've, you've got so many different characters on it. Um, from, you know, elderly to, to the, the mental youths to just, just any Tom, Dick or Harry, but like you come across so many different people. Like we get on on the Boise bus, like the, the chat's filled with different different types of people, all different views and opinions and kind of, and, but you know, healthy debate, which will be promoting the bus. I mean, enjoying the bus, but you must have come uh, up against some some crazy characters when you've been on when you've been on duty, have you not? Uh, yeah, I suppose I have. Um, I haven't had much time to think about some of them. Uh, um, I'm just trying to pull another couple out of my head. Uh, did you not kidnap somebody once? Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, when I was driving. Yeah, I was going to Grantham on the bus, and I, I was approaching this. The road went from being relatively wide to narrow enough room for the two vehicles my bus and the car and uh, went in this narrow bit and thinking the car driver's going to hold back and let me come through but he didn't he decided to come in I thought well fair enough that's all right and I pulled up closer to the curb and uh, as he approached me he gave me the sign that suggested I used to work in the bank and I gave him the sign that suggested he could go forth and multiply um, which he didn't really appreciate. And as I drove past him and I looked in the offside mirror, I could see him, he'd just pulled past this little junction on the on his left, and I could see the reverse lights were on. I thought, oh fuck, here we go. So I pulled up at the next bus stop to let this old gear off, and he come flying up behind me. By the speed he got out of his car, I thought, he's left the engine running. Uh, and he got on the bus, and he had a go at me, and I just, I just said to him, I said, so I'll tell you what, mate, I said, if I was you, I'd get off because I'm going to drive away. And he continued having a go at me. That was his second mistake. His first one was getting on the bus in the first place because uh, then I just shut the doors and drove off with him standing on the platform. <laughs> 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 he wasn't fucking happy, like. Did he not end up uh, to the... He, he managed, he managed... Well, because I was considering, do I stop at the junction in 40 yards and let him off there or do I take him to Warrington, which is about two and a half miles further along the road? But he managed to pull, because the, these exit doors are also emergency doors, he managed to, while I was stuck, he managed to uh, force the doors open and jumped off and shouted that I was in trouble for that. I thought, yeah, I probably am. Um, anyway, he went straight to 
bus station to put his complaint in. I knew he would do that, so I made sure I got plenty of phone numbers of contacts from customers on the bus who would back me up on my story. I got called into the office, um, got a bit of a bollocking for it, and was forced that technically I'd kidnapped the guy because I'd refused to let him off the bus. <laughs> I went, ah, oh, fuck off. I went, like, you know. She said, she'd have gotten the fucking thing anyway. And uh, that was it, really. But yeah, it was quite it was quite amusing, that story was, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, everyone's welcome on our bus. Yeah, we won't drive off in 48 stay on. <laughs> so, so on that note, I'll not keep you on the bus any longer. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed our wee chat. Uh, and if you do have a fancy coming down to Leslie, and you want to do a wee Celtic conversation with me, tell us your story, a wee bit about yourself. Hopefully we get another one of the guys, maybe get Mark Kearney on, maybe get Russell on, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. So thank you very much for watching. <laughs>